Thank you. So this morning, are you ready to be changed by God? Yes. Oh, you're too bold. Let's see how we go by the end of it. I think I'm going to preach, and you will agree with what I'm saying, but if it actually becomes part of us, if it actually becomes us, it's going to be in the church what God has promised, and we say yes to it, this church will be unstoppable. It will, everyone wants to join. It's just going to be like the floodgates open. So I want to ask, I want to begin by asking, um, if it's time to pick a new church, what do you look for? How do you go about it? How do you go about finding a church? Don't, don't steal my thunder. Well, you know, we learned you could go to all the socials on the internet and you do the internet research. I think that's what usually happens these days. Like, that's what I would do. You could go on the internet and you find websites of different churches and you start reading and checking them out, right? And if they got videos of services, you watch some of them. So we do the checking out. What are we looking for? And it's different for everyone, so there's no wrong answer. What are we looking for? If you look for a new church, what are you looking for? Hey, yeah, you want God to be in the place? Yes. Sorry? That they're not occult. Or a cult. Okay. A weird A cult is defined by really ultimate control. You, you don't want to have a community where everything is controlled. Okay, what are you looking for positively? What do you want to see in a church? Children's ministry. Yes, especially if your parents with kids, you want to go somewhere where the kids got a chance. To continue in their faith. Good. Perhaps yeah, you want prayer ministry, says the intercessor. The worshippers say the worship got to be good. I got to be joined in. The word of God got to be preached. Yeah, you want, you want, you want sermons that feed you. Sorry? Coffee. I like honesty. It's amazing, like, how many people notice, like, you come in, is there coffee in the place? Is there a foyer? Is there a coffee shop with it? And, you know, like if you're a really snazzy church, you can order your coffee on your phone and it arrives. Y yeah, can we get that, please? <laughs> Just put it on the wish. Like, if we were able to get it, we would, wouldn't we? So, but, you know, some people look for that. And then, you know, ah, oh, humid, hot day in Toowoomba, summer. What are you looking for? Yeah. Air condition. Yes. And I have a book, I read at seminary, The Twelve Keys to Grow a Church. One of the keys of the twelve was parking. <laughs> yeah, sound system, yes. Parking. Like, really, people choose churches by the ease of finding a car park. I mean, you go shopping like that. Like, so, like, there is something to it. And then, you know, um, do they have outside toilets or not? Sorry? Great worship. Great worship. Yeah, yeah. You want a God be in the place, so that can compensate for the toilets outside. <laughs> so we're asking all these questions. You know when I want to tease Tatiana, I, I, I rave about our beautiful golden chairs. <laughs> and, and that really gets her going because she finds them made of hard plastic. It hurts, and she thinks they're mustard colored. And she doesn't like the color. So. I found a book, um, Taking the Mickey Out of Modern Christians, How to Be a Really Amazing Christian. And he says, when you look for a new church, you've got to check out the name. And the name says, what you're really looking for is a church with a name that sounds like either a retirement community or a natural disaster. So, and gives examples of that. You want Whispering Pine Community Church... Or a Cedar Grove Church. Uh, because, you know, that sounds a little bit like you could be confused with maybe an apartment complex, a, a mini mall, or a delightful retirement community. And why is that attractive? This is a fun book. Why is that attractive? Why, is, why do you want to go to that? Because you grow old and die. Yeah, yeah, you go, they do everything for you. Like, retire, you're not meant to do anything. They look after you, and it's peaceful and nice. And, and the, the other one is um, 
Alternatively, the church should have a name reminiscent of a destructive, destructive act of God. So, for example, names like Granite Deluge of Life, <laughs> Floodwaters Collective, <laughs> Whirlwind Love Fellowship, or Blazing Inferno Church. And, and so why is that attractive? It, well, they really try hard to excite you all the time. So, like, you know, so maybe you get something out of that. So, um, we all, that's making a bit of, that's going a bit to the extreme, but we all look for a church like that. We look, you know, whether it meets our needs, what's on offer there, you know. So, what's the problem with all of that? So, I'm, I'm not knocking it, but I'm agreeing with you. So, when you choose a new church, you, you're checking things out. But if you don't snap out, eventually you've got to snap out of it. After you've done all the discernment stuff and you end up somewhere, you've got to drop the attitude of always checking what they've got. And, oh, this is good and this is not so good. And, like, once you're in, you're in. And you stop being a consumer and always, you know, like, judging everything and this and uh, eval- um. Because if you remain a consumer and you join this church, for instance, for the worship, and then another church opens up, they got better worship, you're gone. Right? Or if they got a better kids' ministry, you're over there. Or if they got better air conditioning, you're over there. Or, like, you know, you, you never actually arrive or belong. You're, it's, it's almost like it's a coffee shop then. And you're at the coffee shop for a while because it's, you know, you've got the culture, it's not a nice groove, and, oh, and then you go a little bit tired of it and... Something else, something new you think happens over there. Why is that wrong? This is not church. And it's killing us because we are actually acting like it is. It's one of the major reasons why the church in the West is weak. We're not achieving anything because we're consumers there and it's about us and, you know, oh, they should do this and they should do that and why don't we have this? We're making commitments as deep as consumers. And it's, it's not helping. So, you know, what about, what about um, doing your research a little bit different? So I'm not saying that I've done that. But, you know, you go to church and the worship is really dreadful. And, and you say, God, do you want me to go there? Because I'm a musician. I could really help them there. Or, you know, ah, oh, you go to a church and they haven't got a kids' ministry and you go home and say, God, I, I love kids. Do you want me to go there and start something? It's a bit radical, isn't it? it it's, it's a bit different. Um, so to finish that point, I, I think what I haven't mentioned it, you do all your checking. I don't think it's anything wrong with If you've got kids... You need a kids' ministry. You need the kid. So there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I wouldn't want to ch- join a church where I don't think God is in. Like, I actually want the presence of God. Like, I, I, I want the pre. So I, you know, I'm. My, but you, you pray to God and say, Where do you want me to be? So you do your checking and then you ask and pray, God, where do you want me to be? And when He places you somewhere, that's where you are. And you stop being a consumer. You're not getting in the, into that attitude. Because what does the Bible say what we are together? We are family. Like, and that is easily said, but we are family. Family. And according to God, our ties are stronger than the ties to our natural family. Like, I I know, you know, it's in the book. I give you a few verses. We're all agreeing with it. We know it's in the Bible, but are we living it? Is that in us? You know, like, are we marinated in that truth? So, like, to all who did receive him, Jesus Christ, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. 
So anyone that belongs to Jesus Christ puts their faith in him, trusts Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, and is saved and belongs to God, is a child of God, and is a child of God together with all the other children of God, which makes us family. And that's how the Bible talks about us, church. We are the family of God. One of the most common ways they talk uh, among themselves, and we're probably not starting it because otherwise Sarah is saying that sounds a bit cultish. They, they call themselves always brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a bit old-fashioned now, but, you know, just, you know, Sister Nikki and brother. Does that mean I can call you my old man? <laughs> what am I? Oh, yeah, I'm the old man, yeah. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Uh, I give you, you know, Jesus' parents and brothers and sisters wanted to talk to him, and he wouldn't go outside because he kept talking with people about the kingdom of God, and he says, my mother and my brother, they're those that do the will of God. And then he said to anyone that wants to be his disciples, if you want to be my disciples, you must by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And then in Mark chapter 10, it says, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one has, who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So we give up family, natural family, and we gain a spiritual family. And the ties are stronger than anything we've ever known in the world. So where is that reality in the world right now? I mean, for us it's a bit theoretical, but where is that reality in the world right now? A persecution, like if you're a Muslim in a Muslim country and you decide to become a Christian, and then if you decide to actually go through with it and be baptized, you, 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 you're marked. You get killed. Like in Pakistan, I, I, I know like, and even Buddhist country, I, I've read like, they may come to faith, but they hold off from baptism because as soon as they take that step, step the community comes and goes after them to kill them. So in Pakistan, for instance, like if you get baptized, you, you've got to run for your life, and you've got to emigrate and because your number is up. So um, even Japan, I, I just read, read the testimony last week. So a granddaughter of a great Japanese industrialist, and what's their religion? It's the ancestor worship. So, yeah, so anyway, it was that. And basically, he overheard her listening to a Christian tape. And then he comes in and asks her, are you a Christian? And she knows in that moment, if I say yes, I may be out on the streets without a family, without an inheritance, without support. How is that for making it real? And, you know, she fessed up and said, yes, I'm a Christian. But that's the risk you take. You say yes to your spiritual family. You say yes to God first and then your natural family. And you know that even in your life now, that, that may, maybe it pans out. What if your natural family always puts on the family get-together Sunday morning, worship time? How long are you going to join them for the barbie before you come here. There are choices to be made. So we're all agreeing with that. We are family, right? It's in the book. God says we are, which basically means we're stuck with one another. Hooray! Hooray. It's like the like, natural family. Once you're placed somewhere, that's your family, and you don't always change. Like, that's what you got. So, but how are we going with that? Does that mean we are automatically loving one another and we all, you know, we are tight with one another? No, we're not. Because even natural family, you may have brothers and sisters in the natural and you may be estranged from them, right? 
You may have a daughter or a brother or a parent that you haven't talked in years, yet you're family. Right? Just because you're family doesn't mean you automatically act like family. Agreed? Yes. And it's the same in the church. And, and this, is where, this is where the rubber hits the road. Because we, we all know and we have known for years that we are family, but we don't act on it. Or many times we don't act on it. This is, this is going to another level. You look at someone and you know they're family. And they're not just this guy over there that I you know, like or don't like. Or, oh. It's just a different level of relating to one another. And because you know, this is difficult and uh, by ourselves we cannot actually do it, God is giving us a hand. So there was another minister, uh, John Alley, and he's been ministering here. Uh, Living Grace as well, some years back in his own church, he had a dream and then he was waiting for the uh, interpretation of the dream. And as he was waiting for inter interpretation, a word came from him from God that said, there is an anointing, which is an empowerment by the Holy Spirit by which community is built. So it's basically saying it's, it is by the Holy Spirit, by something the Holy Spirit is doing that community is being built. And he, he got that word and said, oh, okay, that's, that's an interesting insight. I wonder whether it's true. And um, he actually looked in the Bible and he found out that's actually precisely what happened. On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit first came on the church, what happened? Like, it's not spelled out like, oh, you know, cause and effect, but it's pretty obvious on that first day, the Holy Spirit comes on them. Yeah, they speak like to in tongues and preach and all of that. 3,000 people get added to the church. But then, what does the Holy Spirit do to the, all those thousands of strangers? What happens? Spirit comes on them. They become church. They become family. And then what? They meet every day in their homes and in the temple. They committed themselves to fellowship. And, and then, you know, if that wasn't convincing enough, none of them considered the, their possessions their own. They were sharing all the money with each, each other as everyone had need. That's community. That's caring. That's bonds. That's love. That's amazing. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. There's an anointing by which community is being built. And when John Alley heard that, he thought, oh, well, God is saying that obviously we don't have it. Like, you know, they were just a typical church where, yeah, they were fine and they were going along, okay. But occasionally, you know, there would be people leaving again the church and others would join and then people leaving again. And, you know, it's a bit like that. So what he did one Sunday morning, he was just sharing on the word. He had everyone stand up and he prayed a simple prayer for the Holy Spirit to come upon the church an anointing and empowerment of the Spirit that builds community. That's what they did, and nothing visible happened. But a few weeks later, uh, they have a staff meeting, and one of the staff said, oh, it's, it's really strange. Like, about six weeks ago, all the small groups started all working by themselves. What does that mean? He said, you know, for years and years and years, he tried all sorts of di different models and strategies and encouragements and leadership training to get the small groups, the mini branches the home Bible study fellowships, to get them working, to have people turn up, to have people care for one another, to be excited about it, invite others along, live community, and don't think it's optional, but like they really get into each other and get into each other's lives and care for one another. And six weeks ago, all of a sudden it happened. And, and then, you know, the penny dropped for him six weeks ago was precisely when they prayed that prayer in the church. And this was happening. There was a change happening and he said, you know, two markedly different changes was that God gave people different eyes for one another or a different heart for one another. You know, this one lady said, oh, like, oh, this one over there, you know, I never wanted to sit next to her. I was always avoiding her. And all of a sudden she can't get enough of her and thinks she's, you know, just all that love is just overwhelming her and she's sitting next to her. So... And said, you know, they're different, like, maybe it's mother's eyes. Like, 
Mums love their kids no matter what. Like unconditional love. It's just um, coming over the church. So the home groups were working by themselves. They had different eyes for one another. And the competition stopped. Like people were not envious with one another, you know, jogging for positions and, you know, who gets more credit or whatever. It's just all of that went. And then they also noticed that the staff had to far, far less pastoral care and counselling because the church was just living in community and love and it wasn't necessary. So is that true the Holy Spirit is doing that? Uh, That's not a very convinced yes. (laughs) Yes! We are actually, as Christians, we are a creation of the Holy Spirit. We are born again by the Spirit of God. So right from the beginning, our spirit is alive because the Holy Spirit makes us Christians, children of God. And then the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the sustaining force that keeps us together and makes us one. You know, for instance, Jesus said, he prayed, He said, Father, I've given them the glory, the Holy Spirit that you've given me. I've given to them the Holy Spirit that they may be one as we are one. So it's a creation of the Holy Spirit. Um, Give you another one. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. And then the Bible talks about the unity that is in the church. The family bond is the unity of the Spirit, which is created by the Spirit. So basically what that means is, when you come to church and we worship, and the presence of God comes into the building, and God is in the building, you are set up. Because when the Holy Spirit is here, and you are here, and in God's eyes, you belong to the family of God here. What is, what is he going to do with you? What's his intention? If you allow him to do it, what is he going to do? What is he going to do for you? Uh, don't you know? Was I not clear? He's going to change your heart. The Holy Spirit when he's in the church and operating in the church, is uniting our hearts, knitting it together in love. That's what he does. So because we are not that good at it, so the Holy Spirit says, I do it in my power. If you just allow me to work in you according to what I want to do, I knit your hearts together. I make you one. You are one, but you... Get out of being estranged. I make you one. And sometimes, you know, even a brand new church person, when they come in here and, you know, the worship is going on, they say so many times what they say is it felt like coming home. Have you heard that? It felt like coming. That's the Holy Spirit making us family. So... God is doing all the heavy lifting. We just have to say yes to it. So we agreeing with all of that, I'm sure. Um, I may just, maybe one more point. This was a big hurdle for us in the past, was for me in the past. Uh, I got that totally wrong, and it spoiled all the fellowship. Because for my background... The teaching was, unless you agree in doctrine, you cannot have any fellowship with one another. Not really. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Until you tick all the boxes, doctrine, I check out what you believe about Holy Communion, what you believe about baptism, what you believe about this, and I check it carefully, and if you tick all the right boxes, we can have maybe fellowship. That's... Completely wrong. Wrong. As soon as we are all Christians, as soon as we are born again, as soon as we agree, Jesus Christ saved us. We belong to one another, you know. When does unity in faith and doctrine and all, when, when does that come? At the beginning of walking together or when? 
It's a process. Maturity and understanding everything about God is a process. Because if it wasn't a process, and if we all have to agree with one another, like, I could not even be in fellowship with myself. <laughs> like, you know, I am what I am, but, you know, 10 years earlier, you know, I thought maybe about some matters a little bit differently, so I get excommunicated by that guy. And then 10 years later, I was different again, and 10 years later, I probably knew nothing. So, like, you got four versions of me, and none of them can be in the same church. <laughs> that makes sense, right? Yes. So, as a church, our own history here is that when we gave up on that, like, you know, the penny, it took a while to drop. And first, first we actually acted against our upbringing. And, you know, we were enjoying the fellowship with other Christians, but we were feeling guilty about it. It was a guilty pleasure. Um, yeah, it felt so good to fellowship with other guys and Christians. It was so inspiring. And, but was it allowed? Yes, it was allowed. So maturity comes later. And, you know, like, without a shadow of a doubt, this church, Living Grace Church, what we know, what we know about God today, we've all learned from the other churches. Like all the programs we studied, which were a huge revelation to us at the time. Like we did the Emmaus, you know, give you the Emmaus Walk Ministry, the Elijah's House School of Prayer, Inner Healing Ministry. That was all double Dutch. The purpose driven life, experiencing God, knowing and doing the will of God, a Baptist resource, Alpha, you name it. None of them were Lutheran, and all of them taught us stuff we didn't know. So the unity brought the maturity and the renewal. So, so if that's a hurdle for you, just get over it. It's not really a hurdle. We are children of God together, and the Holy Spirit is... He has an agenda. If we are in unity, and God is among us, He knits us together. It's a unity given by the... That's what He wants to do. And you actually have to resist it not to join in. So if that's true... And we agree that's true. That's still not, we're still not quite there. Because, you know, we, we've got to actually be in step with the Holy Spirit. We've got to actually join in with God was doing. Because we, you can still resist it. You know, if you want to remain a consumer, you remain a consumer, no matter what happens. Like, and it probably doesn't even feel bad. So what do you got to do? How do you practically live church as family? What do you do? Yes, yes. So, like, uh, I'm aiming at something, and I, I tell you what I'm aiming at. There's a commandment that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and it's in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. That sums up all the laws of God. In everything, that's your guiding light. You do to others what you want them to do to you. So, which basically means when it comes to church as family, you're the, you're the one that starts acting like it. Right? What do we usually do? Yes. And, and not only do we wait for the others to do it, we're actually a bit vocal about it. Right? We say, oh, when COVID was on, no one called me. Right? So, and then the question could be, you know, did you call anyone? Oh, I was missing in church for five weeks and no one followed me up. Have you ever followed anyone up? Like, no one invites, you know, I'm new here and no one invites me for lunch. Have you ever invited anyone for lunch? It's just like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we, we put that on others. They should, they should act Christian. They should act church. They should, you know, be a good church. And we exclude ourselves from that. And, and, and Jesus says, no, you are the church. There is no they. You are they. And no matter what the others do, you are family and you act on it. Do to them what you like them to do to you. Does that make sense?
I think by the end of the sermon, we may have to reduce staff. Nothing left to do. <laughs> Just do it ourselves. Um, one, one lecturer in, in a Bible college, his job was to find out what makes a church healthy. What's a healthy church? What does a healthy church look like? And, you know, so he, he, he didn't know. He did all the research and all the books and read the Bible and read the Bible with his students. And then he stumbled across something in the Bible where there are dozens and dozens and dozens of Bible verses which say, you do this to one another. One another. And I, I give you uh, a sample of this one. So, love one another. That's, that's at least 16 times. Love one another. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Build up one another. Be like-minded towards one another. Accept one another. Admonish one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burden. Forgive one another. Be patient with... Fifty. Like... And he stumbled across that and couldn't get away from it. And it, the penny dropped for him. That's the healthy church. Where people in the church, they do that to one another. That's the spiritually healthy church. And so he was teaching and getting excited about the discovery. And the students got excited about the discovery. And then the students said, it, look, you should start a church and try it out. So, yeah, he wrestled with that one. And then he resigned and planted a church. And out of that church, you know, that started exploding. And out of that church, hundreds were planted. And that was at the core of all of them. If you want to be a healthy church, the one another got to happen. It's family. There's, it's not a spectator sport. Everyone is in it. And we have a heavenly father. And all of us imitate our heavenly father. And how he is, we all are. And we do that to one another. Is that good news or bad news? Yes. It's great news. Because who doesn't want to be in a community like that? Right? Like, Count Zinzendorf, he's a you know, in church history, lived in the 1700s. They were just a, a church congregation, I think, 300. They were all refugees, and he had an estate, and out of that, there were missionaries sent all over the world. He had a huge, amazing impact. But they, they liked telling this anecdote where he was visiting somewhere, and this lieutenant wanted to have a conversation with him. And yeah, and they talk about Jesus and have a good time. And, and then Count Zinzendorf asked him, um, are, there, do, are you in fellowship with other Christian people? Are there other Christians here? And he said, yeah, there are two soldiers that are also Christians. And then, you know, we visit one another almost every day. And he said, oh, that's really fellowship. And then he said, I acknowledge no Christianity without fellowship. And after listening to this sermon, we agree. It's in the book. Like, there is no Christianity without fellowship because you are placed in family. You're not an isolated, safe person somewhere. You are among brothers and sisters, and there's all this one another thing happening. You cannot be a Christian in isolation. So having said that, how many Christians live in isolation in Toowoomba? Thousands. Thousands. Like, it's the biggest church in Toowoomba are the people that no longer go to church. Do they have good reason for not going to church? Like, you know, we, we can be honest. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, you, but usually, most of the time is there's a bit of a spat somewhere. There's a fallout of relationship and then, you know, like, 
Yes, so, you know, that's usually the case. And then, you know, I look at all the headlines of ministers of worldwide reputation that I like and I've listened to and I've learned from and then it gets uncovered. They've been living a life of sin and there's corruption and doing stuff that shocks me. Right? And what, what could be my natural reaction? If the leaders are like that, if the church is like that, if people say that they're Christians, they're like that, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I just stay at home and I'm justified doing it. Right? Like, with a bit of attitude. Yeah, first you do it with a bit of attitude and then you get hard, hardened and stubborn and you, you just, like, you can't be reached. But is, is that an option for us? It's not. But I tell you what, it's killing us. It's absolutely killing us. Like, according to God, the church, his people, are the answer to the world's problems. We carry the message of salvation. We carry the power of God. If, if there's homelessness in the city, if there's corruption in the government, if, if there's... Um, domestic violence, you name all those problems, we are meant to come with an answer. This goes way beyond having satisfying Sunday morning worship attendance. We are an army. We are a family of God. And, and we are agents of the kingdom of God. And we're meant to make a difference. And it's not possible if we're not in fellowship. It's not possible if we don't live the family life. Because we save people out of darkness. And then they come in here, they, ha they no longer have family members that are also going in the same direction. They need cleaning up. They need freedom. They need discipling. And they need an environment where they can live, where kingdom values are priority. You know, this is the first sermon that I preached in the new season. And, you know, I didn't pick the topic. Like, it was just, but I think it's so timely. we got to get this right about church and about who we are. Otherwise, we're not making any headway. The Spirit is here. But are we getting on board with it? The Spirit is here to make us one, to knit us together. And, yeah, is it good news or bad news? You know, this is preaching with a bit of um, heft. But it is good news. It is absolutely amazing, stunningly good news. Because the world is going one way, and we're going a different way, but we don't have to be on our own. There's encouragement. There's support. There's love. When we're down, we can come together and encourage one another and make it until we're all together in heaven, the family of God in heaven. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I just know, like, God is going to change us. I really, like, we, we're all agreeing, but there's another level for us, I tell you, of being family. Agreed? Like, this is, we're all in with one another. Everyone. Not just picking a few, not just a clique. All of us. The family. Okay, let's stand up. Stand up. So you're going to say it. You're saying a yes to God, and then I pray for the anointing to come. Like, so it's yes to God to family. You just say, yes. 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 yes! Lord, we're saying yes. We probably don't even know the full implications of it. Lord, but we belong to one another, Lord. Everyone belongs. Not, not even just the ones we like. Not just the young, not just the old. Everyone. Not just the rich, not just the poor. Everyone. Everyone belongs, Lord. And we're saying yes to it. And Lord, the people that you put together in this church as family and to act as family. Lord, I pray right now 
Lord, that you have mercy on us again. And Lord, you just send, you just renew the spirit among us that creates community. Lord, we're open to it. Lord, I pray you, you know, past offenses, we let them go right now. We just let go of all the rubbish, Lord, all the hurdles, all the objections we may have. And Lord, we do say yes to what you've done among us. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Everyone belongs. And Lord, we are open for the Holy Spirit to change our hearts, to change our minds. We are open for the Holy Spirit to come upon us and change our hearts for one another. So love comes naturally. And Lord, it's a supernatural work from heaven. And the love, your love among us would be just so amazing that people will recognize it and they want to have part of it, Lord. I pray for the church, for the health of the church. Lord, just do it for us. Pour out your spirit on us. Lord, change our thinking, our feelings, our heart. Lord, stir us up to love. And Lord, stir us up to do. Lord, you give us something to do. You, you make us see a gap in the church and we step in. Lord, we serve one another. And Lord, there's so much joy in it. And Lord, as we become healthier as a church, Lord, I pray for a readiness in, in all of us that the family can be extended. Lord, that we are ready for the new families, members that come in. Lord, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were added to 120, just pretty much overwhelming them. But Lord, oh Lord, by your spirit, we want to be overwhelmed. And Lord, you sort it out by your spirit. You made them family in a day. Lord, and they recognized one another and they devoted themselves to fellowship. Lord, I pray that we just become a mighty movement of God. The family of God that is expanding. The family of God that is healthy. The family of God that has answers for this world in your name. Lord, just do it among us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.